I, I really appreciate the Army focusing on this. Uh, I think, you know, we have this very um, kind of dual challenge and opportunity in Alaska. The challenge is the uh, very high rates of suicide, which nobody wants. And, and I, I really appreciate the Army focusing on this. Uh, I think you've put all your best minds to it. It's a complex problem, but I want to thank all of you, Madam Secretary, you were in Alaska recently. The Vice Chief was in. General, you're up there a lot. So um, we talked about some of what you're thinking through, both from a surge capacity on um, professionals that can provide help, but also as part of the Arctic strategy that you've been uh, focused on for quite some time, uh, new capabilities um, in Alaska, and I, and I was wondering if you both uh, wouldn't mind touching on both of those topics right now. And um, again, I appreciate your full attention to this issue, which I know concerns you as much as it concerns me and the people I represent. Certainly, Senator Sullivan. I, you know, I think really there are two big things that we're trying to do in Alaska right now uh, under the umbrella of the Arctic strategy for the Army. First, as we talked about yesterday, we are really trying to surge a significant quantity of behavioral health providers to help deal with the mental health issues. Uh, so we have behavioral health folks going up. We are sending military family life counselors. We are sending chaplains. And that will be a six-month surge. And we will be doing a 100% mental health check of every U.S. Army Alaska soldier. Thank you. One of the things we found in addition that we think is contributing potentially to some of what we're seeing in Alaska is that some of the soldiers there don't feel like they have a sense of identity or purpose around why they're stationed there. So we are looking at, as we talked about yesterday, reflagging the U.S. Army Alaska headquarters as the 11th Airborne Division, which is a division that was disestablished but has a very storied lineage. lineage uh, and we're thinking of essentially renaming U.S. Army Alaska 11th Airborne Division. So that would be an details. operational... Yes, it would command. become an operational headquarters, the two brigades that are there. It, you know, We're not adding or subtracting force structure. It's, it's really sort of more of a a new um, sense of common identity for the soldiers up there. Great. General, you have a, any yeah, thoughts yeah, on that? As Secretary said, you know, as, as we, we give them the identity, um, you know, haven't had a chance to serve in an Airborne Division, the 101st Airborne Division. The, the 11th has a, a great history and heritage. That means a lot to soldiers and tabs on their on their badges and, and things like that matter. But but also we're looking at, you know, the Arctic very differently. We put out a strategy. Uh, we think it's very different. We've got to be able to operate in that environment. Uh, we've got to make sure the units have the capabilities, and that gives them the confidence to be somewhat special. You're the ones that, you know, can operate with the right equipment and, and even transform uh, some of those units so they have the right vehicles uh, to operate in the coldest time. They have the right equipment and the right clothing. And all those things come together to give them a sense of identity. And that's who we send there. We have a lot of people that want to go to Alaska. They go up there and they thrive. We have some that don't. They just have a tough time. And I think COVID has exacerbated a lot of the type, the challenge we have because isolation and, and, and that's something we're recognizing. We talk about the building these cohesive teams. You build a cohesive team around a mission and you give them focus and you give them identity and that's what brings them together. And, and that's what we want to try to do. Thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, we talked yesterday about the civilian behavioral health support when it's difficult to fill in a lot of places in the country. It's been particular difficult to fill in Alaska. Do you think changing the ratio of uniform to civilian behavioral health providers can, in remote locations, I'm not just talking about Alaska, this happened in other places in the Army globally, not just in the U.S., can that help alleviate the challenge and the shortage problem? Um, something we're looking at here in the uh, committee. Senator, I do think it's something that we need to look at. Uh, that, that was something I talked about with General Eifler in Alaska. I talked to his uh, hospital director. We want to look at that. I mean, we, of course, need to look at how, you know, what are the second and third order effects for changing those ratios? Because we have to make sure we've got enough medical, military medical providers for the whole army, but it's something we want to look at, certainly. And let me ask, um, final question, um, kind of two part. As part of the uh, 11th Airborne, we were just talking about the multi-domain task force. I know that's something you were looking at in Alaska. 
um, as well. Uh, and then the recent USERAC large scale exercises in Jay Park in March. Can you provide a readout just briefly on some of the takeaways from that? I know it's very significant, hard, hard training, uh, joint training um, in very cold weather. Uh, any, any thoughts and takeaways on lessons learned from that as it relates to what you're planning on in Alaska and then beyond multi-domain task force and other yeah, I can tell you, Senator, you know, we, we kind of want to train where we're going to fight. And historically, you know, Alaska's been more of a basing place. And we took our uh, troops out of there and we'd either send them to the National Training Center or to Fort Polk. And, you know, Fort Polk in the summer is probably just is not the equivalent of the Arctic in the winter. So, you know, it's it, what we learned was conducting exercises, you know, in the winter in a, a combat training center like in 